Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us at the Cloud Networking Summit uh, virtual edition. Um, though we've only done one of these, so obviously they're all virtual now, apparently. Um, so obviously this panel is sort of to round off the day, sort of to try and address uh, the big question, you know, what is the future of cloud networking? Taking all those threads that we've heard throughout the day about how different markets are responding, how home working has changed, what sort of new approaches are there and new technologies, and kind of just try and wrap that all together into a bit of a discussion about you know, where we're going next. Is it intelligent networking? Is it AI? Is it more security? And how we're going to handle those challenges. Um, so I'm joined by a few panelists here. We're just missing one, but I'm sure he'll be joining in a few seconds. Uh, I think he was having some technical difficulties. And I'm sort of going to hand over to them just to introduce themselves, uh, give you a bit of an idea of who they work for, what they do. And maybe they can tell you a bit sort of what they think the greatest advancement they've seen or interesting thing they've seen in cloud networking in the past year was just to give you a bit of a uh, a taste of how they're looking at the industry. Um, so um, I don't know who wants to start. Maybe Simon, you want to take it away for us? Yeah, sure. Happy to. So uh, Simon Pemplin, I'm the technical director for EMEA for Silverpeak. Um, we focus 100% on, on SD-WAN and have been doing so for, for many years. As a company, we've been around since 2004 and came out with our SD-WAN solution in, uh, in 2015. So probably the, the most interesting thing I think I've seen in the advancement of cloud networking it's automation, automation and intelligence. And that's really what we're all about, trying to make the utilization of cloud networking simple, easy, and secure apart from anything else. So we're all about making the on-ramp to cloud infrastructure literally just a mouse click. So the, the average company out there can transition to the benefits of the cloud in a very simple and, and less complicated manner than previously they had to do when there was all sorts of manual IPsec tunnels being built now it's all about automation. So you can fully utilize and get the benefit of cloud. That, that's really what I'm seeing at the moment. OK. David, how about yourself? Yeah, let me introduce myself. So uh, David Nogrebao, I work for Juniper Networks. I'm uh, the marketing director for service provider channel. So Juniper has been at, um, providing one environments for, for enterprises for a long time. And a few years ago, we started our SD1 product as an evolution to our uh, secure routers. Um, so uh, the new trends we see with with SD One, let's say the, the the bases are there. Everyone understands what the basic SD One should be. But uh, I, I would agree with Simon that automation has been kind of mandatory. Zero touch provisioning, all these aspects, is absolutely important in this environment. Um, but probably I would start looking at the next the next stages, and 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 we are very concerned about. Um, what it what goes beyond SD One and what's inside that branch that it's connected with SD One? So the LAN, the the, the Wi Fi, how can all these be managed all together? Um, and a second important aspect is uh, the user experience from user to cloud, from application to the cloud, uh, and being able to understand this. Uh, the traffic, the, the 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 stream of data goes there, and if it is providing the the right quality expected. I think that that's very important. I've said a few things that they definitely sound very impressive, but when we think of those things at scale, uh, at the scale that an operator service provider needs to deliver, uh, we see that manual operations are not possible. So here, going back to automation is needed, but probably not even just automation. AI, machine learning needs to be here to help and make sure that the network keeps up at improving all the time. OK. Um, Dave, I see you've just joined us now. Can we just make sure we can hear you? Okay, we cannot hear you, unfortunately. No. <laughs> it would not be uh, an event without technical difficulties. While he's sorting that out, Dimitri, why don't you um, <laughs> introduce yourself for us? Not a problem. Hi, everyone. My name is Dimitri Polidoro. I lead Cisco Meraki's global service provider and partner uh, systems engineering group. Uh, based out of San Francisco. And um, Meraki, of course, if, if you don't know Meraki, we, we offer a wireless LAN switching security SD-WAN products. Um, but more recently, we've entered the smart camera and IoT business as well. We've just launched a series of sensors. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited to see what a lot of our customers and our, and our service providers, our partners have been doing with the data that's been coming from the sensors, from the cameras to really solve for use cases that have been emerged through the need to remote work, the need to return to office safely, 
driven off course by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're, we're living in a pretty exciting time and it's great to see how we're able to solve customer problems beyond just basic networking through the power of the technology we build. Okay, that's really interesting. I mean, we're already seeing some discussion of trends there. So why don't we dive into that a bit more? So obviously we've had a nice bit of discussion about automation. And I guess when people think about automation, they're primarily thinking in terms of just plug and play and things like that. But I mean, I think it goes deeper than that. Um, and I know that everyone here is working on some form of automation at a next level. So maybe, you know, I mean, David, you, you've spoken a lot about mist and, and things like that in terms of automation. Do you want to weigh in on that? The level beyond? Oh, you are muted, David. Okay, sorry. Uh, the... There we go. Yeah, thanks for, for that. So, um, yeah, well, MIST is uh, an acquisition we made a year ago uh, and basically brings a lot of the AI capabilities into our portfolio. We are extending those capabilities across uh, all our enterprise offering. Uh, so basically for SD1, for managed LAN and for managed Wi-Fi, what we see in automation is what we call day zero, day one, and day two onwards, right? So basically day zero is the planning uh, shipment when a customer would go into a portal, they would subscribe to a service that would receive the right equipment. Day one would be when they plug it, it should be zero, zero touch provision, it should get the templates that, that, that they contracted with, uh, with the right service. And then from day two onwards is more about monitoring, make sure that this service that was up in day one, it's still running, it runs on the on the service level agreements that are needed, but also it allows to feedback it to the model where this customer can keep adding uh, solutions. So we think on a, on a model that should be very open um, uh, to, it should not be like single vendor. And we understand that the solutions differ, especially when we go in areas like IoT and things like that, uh, there are pl uh, plenty of use cases and this is why we live in a more uh, open space but but still the, the, the fact we go open and we are able to plug third-party iot devices or even security or routers we um, need to make sure that we are monitoring those things so if you leave a camera or you have a sensor connected um, uh, it's very easy to test it works on day one but maybe day two it starts transmitting information or or it has some interruption so we want a robot, an AI engine, and this is what Mervis from Mist brings to tell me hey, this camera is not working or is not transmitting at what it's expected. So, so you see that that's the type of interaction that we expect. So it's automation to a level that makes it easier to manage and makes the, the service uh, more useful for the end user. Yeah. Uh, let's just check, David, can we hear you now? Or Dave, sorry. Uh, let's try that again. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. We can indeed. Uh, Miracles of, of technology. Yes. Good afternoon, folks. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, so, do you have any thoughts on automation? We'll let you introduce yourself once we finish off this topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, lacking context on what on, on what was already communicated. Uh, it's I might be repeating some of the messages that were that were given given here, but just before I got into this phone call, I was chatting with uh, our security folks um, over at over at Cato and Cato is uh, it's a converged networking security platform. We'll talk about it perhaps later later in the call. But what was particularly interesting to me is how machine learning and automation has enabled on the security side, the processing of threat intelligence feeds and has dramatically allowed uh, even small teams to scale up and, and to do that quite effectively in ways that we, we haven't been able to do before. Um, and I think we're gonna see more of that in, in the industry. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think managing security, especially when you're dealing with lots of IoT devices and automated networks, probably becomes more and more of a, a, a you know, a key concern. Uh, Dimitri, I know you were talking about a lot of technology you've been deploying on the IoT front. Are you finding the same things as David in terms of the level of data you're now having to manage and how that's sort of tying things together? Part, partly. So being able to manage the data is one thing, but then to be able to expose that to customers so they can you know, they consume that themselves, process that information, or even integrate with the third party platforms through our ecosystem partners to have them drive additional use cases specific to the industry vertical. We're seeing a lot of traction there, as I mentioned earlier, particularly now with COVID, it's really accelerating right now. The, con the convergence of the networking and security domains um, on the one hand allows service providers and vendors just a wealth of information that we haven't been able to, to get to before. Um, mm -hmm. 
And the ability to take advantage of that information um, is going to almost drive the need for auto, for greater automation, automation machine learning um, in, in all of our infrastructure. Um, there's just, it, it's quite remarkable what you can do when you take security data, networking data, and you mash them together, the things that you can, that you can learn about your network, the patterns that you can detect. And um, that's equally applicable to IoT networks. It's equally, equally applicable to legacy enterprise networks as well. And it's interesting, there's that, I mean, there's that, that niche, this trend that we're seeing where data is just becoming more and more prolific, right? And of course, Cato falls into that place as both someone who has their own technology and an MSP. So you're kind of lucky in the situation that you generate the data and then can also process it and consume it yourself without you know, right. So, so you, 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 you'll excuse me. I think I came in after the introductions. Is that right? Yeah. You know, we've all done, done the two minute introduction thing. So yeah. just just one minute about Cato, um, yeah. and we'll get back to the to the topic at hand, of course. But Cato is is well, you probably are all familiar with the Secure Access Service Edge (SASE) that that Gartner defined about a year ago. Now, Cato has been delivering a SASE service now for three years. Um, we converge networking security into the cloud, into a cloud native platform, and we connect the entire enterprise. That means mobile users, um, IoT devices, uh, um, branch offices, data centers, uh, cloud resources onto a single global common backbone that both connects and secures your 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 infrastructure, your infrastructure um, traffic. So um, uh, we have a next generation firewall, IPS and a whole range of security services uh, built into built into to Kato. But what I think is particularly interesting is that you know as you go through that process, and we're not the only ones going through that process. Is a I think is a trend that the, the, all of us here are engaged with this trend of bringing networking and security together. Um, you begin to be able to tap in both to event data that has always existed in the in, in, the, in the networking space. And security data, you know, intelligence suites or, or what have you, that have existed in that space, but now they're co-residing in a in a common data warehouse, and, and, and they've been normalized. They're they're in a, they're in a, they're, in a, they're, in a, they're in a platform that can actually be analyzed together. There's a lot of additional work that has to be done just to get the data into a common data space where analysts can can actually work on the data, uh, and that becomes very exciting, I think, for enterprises and for you know for solutions providers because we can now all bring out. Um, Security with much greater resolution than we than what we've been able to do. Um, um, uh, eliminating false positives would be one example of, of the outcome of that, right? So that that, with that with that's one example, but there are many other examples of how when you combine the two domains together, you just get a better product of, overall. Hmm. I wanted to ask, for, since we are talking about security, just a, an important point uh, I think that Dave brought. Uh, Having visibility across a network and and security deeper into the into the the enterprise space is is important. Um, in the past, I think we tend to think of security being the firewall. Uh, Juniper, in our connected security story, security has to be everywhere. Yes, of course, if we can centralize things in the cloud. Why not? And we can collect information absolutely. But but if we detect something that happens, I don't know, into uh, that an access point, we detecting that the that there's a flow coming from an access point inside and. Uh, an enterprise uh, environment or network, we would like to be able to tell that access point to shut down this traffic or direct it to a different VLAN. So you see that immediately we put any network element, networking element in the network, even in a multi-vendor environment, uh, we put every networking element um, to work for security. So it may not be able to detect the security issue, but then can act to block that security issue that's been detected somewhere else. And I think that we never had that before. So and I think this right. is a combination of cloud managed plus uh, collecting all that information and, uh, and, and and security platforms all together. Mm -hmm. I think this does raise an interesting question, though, because one of the things that we want to look at this panel is, is how, um, for the service providers in the audience, they handle these these changes that are coming in. And I mean, obviously, we're in a position where the service providers would have their data that they would generate, and the vendors would have their other data they generate as the person sitting over the platform, especially with sort of a multi-tenant solution. So I guess the question then is, who's going to own this data moving forward? Who's going to be the person that's, you know, does it have to be the vendor so they can pass through it and aggregate it and make the service work? Where does the service provider do, 
get their data and where do you know that they can use or do you think there'll be a sharing arrangement like you said finbar i mean you know cato's a bit unusual here we're not an appliance vendor we're both the technology provider and the service provider mixed into one um it goes to our dna we believe that to be very very important because you're right you know the the isps for a long time have had incredible visibility into into networking data um, that security security vendors haven't had, right? They, they, they yeah. see the traffic um, all the time. And then, this, of course, the security vendors have had deep you know, security expertise that the, that the ISP community uh, has lacked. And, and bringing the two together, uh, we believe to be critical moving, uh, moving forward. Um, it just provides you with a degree of resolution that we haven't had before. Um, and allows you, it allows you to do simple things like delivering. You know, David, I like your point about being able to shut down you know, a uh, threat, you know, in a Wi-Fi network. Um, I like that very much. You know, with people working at home, that Wi-Fi network could be anywhere, right? And they, they, you, could be, you could be on the road as well, or you could be in the office. And I think just the ability to, to connect users no matter where they are and to secure them no matter where they are is what, um, is what enterprises are going to want, and it's what service, service providers, providers are going to have to deliver moving forward. Hmm. And do you think service providers are going to struggle with this? I mean, just dealing with the partners that you've had in terms of, I don't know, skills or capabilities or just their ability to comprehend what's actually being offered? Is that a question to me or a question to uh, uh, yeah, anyone? Uh, yes, wants. yes. Go on. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in if Dave, Dave needs to have a, a drink of water. So I, there I, I would argue the fact that what these, yeah. What the service providers are, are probably going to need to look at going forward is the ability to choose best of breed because they're bringing on customers who are moving from their own private networks into maybe a service or a cloud hosted service and a lot of customers will have a preferred security vendor they'll have a preferred way of working preferred policies and procedures and that all has to be taken into account you can't just say to a customer you will take our security because it may not fit their solution they may be heavy on iot they may have it may be a retail company that has intelligent freezers for argument's sake. There may be different requirements and that, that best of breed ability to take what is out there in the changing nature of our own industry, and we all know things change on a daily basis, is I think what is going to make service providers agile and more importantly relevant to their own customers and, and arguably that that's important because the customer is going to make the choice based on what fits best into their way of working. So I think there's a, a, a bunch of other things outside of the the, the technical aspects that we all you know, love to talk about all, all day long. But from a customer's perspective, it's much more simple than that. It's how can I, as a business, function as my business wishes to function, not how the technology will allow me to do it. Oh, it looks like we and maybe just to add to that as well. Add, on, Dimitri, yeah. add an extra. Yeah, we've lost Finbar, I think. But just to add an extra lens to that as well, like just looking at this from, from the service provider's perspective, there, there's also, in, in many, many countries, uh, an extra level of complexity that they'll have to overcome around regulatory requirements. Like many have requirements where they have to perform interception, lawful interception, other other elements on their internet services. As we start to move this traffic to the cloud, to the secure access edge and other solutions, we're effectively encrypting that and sending it through the service providers network, which breaks a lot of that, how that works today. So there, there's gonna be a lot of challenges I'll need to overcome in order to to roll these services out at scale. I can definitely see that, yeah. Especially the second the government starts to get involved, it may not be so easy for a vendor rather than a service provider to gather that data to do that level of automation. So that might be an actual challenge for the entire industry is figuring out who actually has the right or the authority in different regions to be the person who collects the data and how that, how that works. And that'll be a very interesting trend. This, this might alienate me from my uh, my three compatriots here. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, hold the darts just, just for one second. Uh, but I think that if you look at the SASE model, this is not Cato, this is, you know, Gartner SASE model. Um, what it posits is, is um, the convergence of appliances, the appliance functionality that we've always had, the networking and security functionality, will converge together uh, into a cloud native stack. This is what Gartner is saying, not us. Um, and there are many reasons to believe that will happen. Um, a multi-tenant cloud native SAC is something that allows you to, um, it's more affordable, it's more scalable. There are a lot of reasons we can go into as to why 
why uh, why that's the case. But I think fundamentally, Simon, it, best of breed was an argument that, that worked well in the 90s. But I think that what Gartner is saying is that it's convergence that, that will work well in the 2000s or 2020s, as, as the case may be. Um, um, I'm reminded, someone one time said to me, you know, basketball players are all six, over six feet tall. So, like, it doesn't mean to say that if you're a basketball player, if you're over six feet tall, you're going to be an NBA player. It does mean to say that you need to be over six feet tall to be an NBA player, right? And I think it's something very similar here. You need to provide the core functionality that, that customers require, absolutely. But what you really need to do is converge technology. You need to have the visibility across technology domains in order to deliver the kinds of the degree of security and the degree of, of networking that we know is going to be required when users work everywhere. So Dave, I will hold back on the darts on that as, you, as you'd expect. So <laughs> best of breed doesn't preclude you from the, the cloud security environment, you know, quite the opposite. I mean, our best of breed solutions with the likes of Zscaler, Checkpoint, Netscope, et cetera, and some of the industry's best known cloud security solutions providers. And that gives the best of breed approach for the end customers, many of which have relied on the likes of Checkpoint, Zscaler, and Netscope for many years. And they know it, they understand it, they like it, they trust it. And trust in security, that, that's 100% of the argument. So what we tend to see with a lot of um, the SD-WAN providers that, that try and uh, compress all of these functions, including next-gen firewalls, and I'd argue that SASE is the death of the next-gen firewall, and we can discuss that at length, no doubt, is that you end up compromising you end up forcing a customer down a route that they may not want to go to. So we believe, and we've had a strategy for many years, the best of breed gives you the flexibility of taking on new solutions, the best solutions, and switching at will. You're not sunk into one offering, whether that offering delivers everything your business wants to do today and, more importantly, tomorrow. You can chop and change using open REST APIs and full integration to the best of breed for your business. So uh, no darts fired, Dave. <laughs> Yeah, maybe uh, on yeah, just just to bring a little bit also of the color here from from Juniper. So our strategy, we believe, needs to go uh, uh, and provide the, the the right support and solutions to the different stages of the enterprises when they they adopt from they they move away from just MPLS and to start adopting SD one features, etc. So. The, it's still very early. I mean, we we are all talking like uh, SD one. It's 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 all times right, but it's many enterprises haven't yet done that journey, uh, and they will keep uh, MPLS for a while. So, okay. So what what is the type of security they'll require? We cannot tell them. Hey, fr you move from MPLS to having everything now in the cloud. They'll be se uh, sec enterprises that might be going that route. I'm not saying that they won't, but most of them will go in different stages and they will expect a solution that evolves with them. So our strategy is let's bring what they need today. We secure at the edge of the enterprise and gradually we can bring pieces of that security into the cloud as they need. Many they would like at the early stages to mimic the, the, the IP VPN, providing IPsec VPN overlays, but we see that they immediately realize that all this traffic goes into the cloud. So there's no need to, to re-encrypt the traffic that the application had encrypted already once. So then this is like, it, it's it's a connectivity to the cloud at, at, at scale and, and being able to preserve that quality of experience. So I see that at every stage, there might be a slightly different needs, what we don't want is this customer to move stage by stage and having to th to change everything. They can remove functionality and move that functionality to somewhere else, knowing that the way they will interact with this is exactly the same way that they interacted when it was all distributed, for example. And, and also applying security or additional security features, moving into other spaces, like, like I said, LAN or Wi-Fi should be just uh, an add-on on top of what they have and not something that is going through a painful system. And, and, and just the last thing is every time they move one more stage in that, that strategy to, to, to better manage their branches would always, I mean, if we can bring this one plus one equals three every time they move away. So it's not that they'll get now a router and a line and a switch and router and switch and a wi-fi no it's actually by grouping them they, they have the advantage of being able to look to see other data for example so uh, or, or better security so you see that that's that's a strategy and, and actually we believe this is how service providers will be will be um 
um, winning in that race because they'll be able to provide something different than when the enterprise builds those things, those things themselves because that they won't be able probably to um, uh, bring do all those things together. So that that's a little bit our our view in that. But yeah, definitely things are moving centralized, but it will take time. Mm. I mean, convergence within the industry is happening quite a lot as well. I mean, I'm looking at one startup. Uh, or a, you know a bit later on the startup journey, and I'm also looking at three companies that have either recently or in the past few years made acquisitions or been acquired um, by by other companies. So there is there is this feeling that the industry itself is converging. And I was are are there any other are, are there any any more standalone SD WAN vendors? Uh, Actually, I think I think yeah. Infovis yeah. would make an argument. And, and, and like and I guess you'd say pure you know who are only offering SD-WAN, right? You don't have uh, um, security built on them, but just, just SD-WAN alone, very, very few. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things because I've, I've been tracking the market and I, I keep basically folding names into other names. Um, <laughs> and like making those belong to someone else now. Uh, but I guess that is a valid question. You know, Infovis, uh, not Infovista, sorry, Silver Peak would obviously argue that um, there is a, a role for a best in breed player, and we've we've heard from Simon saying that. Um, but I guess the question is, you know, is it going to be the security vendor that starts acquiring the right network company, and starts offering those services bundled together? You know, are they are they going to be the people that that people turn to? You know, or is it going to be the network expertise that wins out? That's I think that's an interesting point of discussion. The network versus security debate. Haven't we had that debate for a long time? <laughs> yeah, we have. But... It cannot be network versus security. It has to be network and security. No, right? exactly, so exactly. But yeah, exactly. It, might, it might be perceived this way because uh, unfortunately, one of the things we see of all that convergence between network security, but also the LAN and, and, and all that, is that maybe the enterprises, they are not ready to accept this transformation. And, and when we talk to enterprises or our service provider customers talk to enterprises, they realize that the decision making sits in different teams. The, the, the team who decides on Wi-Fi and LAN is different from one or SD1 and different from security. So how, how can you pitch something that will help them to do it better? Maybe they fear of, of there could be a risk of, of losing their job, or maybe they, they don't they want to step in someone else's shoes. So I think that's uh, something that th there is a little bit of an elephant in that room that that probably needs to needs to be sorted out and only those enterprises who made this transformation in their organization probably they'll be benefiting and hopefully this will bring them a competitive advantage that makes all the other industries to move towards that direction of re-imagine their uh cio group right because i think that is ultimately one aspect that if they want to take advantage of that conversions uh, that happens of technologies, not only vendors, but technologies in general, they need to get ready to buy this way. Look, you know, I think we've, we've seen with every change uh, that goes on in the industry, um, there has to be a way to fit into the existing uh, network, right? So when we look at SASE, you know, it, it, no one expects a legacy uh, network to be converted over to SASE overnight, right? Cato certainly doesn't, and I don't think Gartner does or anybody else does, right? And every SASE solution must be able to fit into the legacy infrastructure and support the legacy infrastructure to allow a graceful migration. And Cato certainly does that. We've got, we have customers today who have have replaced their MPLS backbones with Cato. Cato has an alternative, affordable alter alternative to MPLS built into the, you know, into the Cato SASE offering, a private, a global private backbone. We have customers who run us side by side. We've got customers who use us for remote access, customers who use us for security. I mean, you know, you, you have to be able to create a platform that's going to adapt to the needs of the customer. I don't think Cato's alone on that. I think also with you folks as well, um, your companies as well have found ways to, to support a hybrid network at the same time time we need to provide a transition a transition towards the future what's the future and of course one of the problems with appliances is that we 
put our customers in a cycle of having to constantly upgrade their appliance, right? You, you know, you 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 see capacity jump. All of a sudden, you need to you get you need you need a new appliance. You need to get you know, open up a, a new location. Suddenly, you need to somehow ship out a new appliance to a distant location. You've got users working from home. Well, appliances won't work from that at all. Now you need to come up with a whole new product. And I think. The, the power of converging the technologies together and getting rid of the appliance form factor, it's the power of the cloud service. It's available everywhere. I think that's just very attractive over the long term to IT. And frankly, I think that service providers need to get themselves thinking about that. Um, you know, shipping appliance has been, very, has been very helpful in the past, but I question whether or not in 10 or 20 years time from now, and probably a lot sooner than that, right, whether it will be a... Uh, a uh, an appliance still you know the the uh, an appliance based industry i think it will change dramatically it's the cloud it's always the cloud well but physics tell us that you always need some sort of appliances right so i cannot imagine uh, access point centralized in the cloud or 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 it, a router it, or well, it obviously it, right i mean it depends on, it depends on the Absolutely. use case that we're talking about right i Absolutely. mean let's you know so right. but I mean, what what i meant is that uh, i think as long as there is some footprint, some presence, the service provider will take advantage of that to, to, right. to build differentiation and to, to the things that are inevitable, right? So things that they can only be done on site. But yeah, you're right. The other things, whether it's controlled remotely or whether you move completely the functionality remotely and you put you move that, that traffic all to that centralized place, those are strategies that are definitely um, moving on. And, and here's probably also um, if the service provider that doesn't do it themselves so the telcos don't do it themselves we believe there'll be a, a, a long list of over-the-top providers happy to do that on behalf right. of the service providers and and even the the traditional the hyperscalers the cloud providers themselves they can come with their own sd1 offerings with their own sassy offerings because the, someone has to do it so i think that that's the risk so if whether they they, they embrace the transition or or they are risk to being marginalized once once again mm -hmm. Hmm. I think that's a pretty big question as to how you handle the risks of sort of moving forward in this industry. Um, you know, and there's obviously the actual physical considerations of the devices and the hardware and a secondary market selling on devices too. So people who are cost conscious don't need to necessarily um, move to the latest thing straight away. Um, I guess just a question on, on the convergence thing before we move off it is that do you think there are any elements of security or networking that are always going to require a specialist to take on? Or, you know, do you think that there's just always going to be a way to c fully converge these two industries, I guess? Or do you think there's always going to, is there going to be a holdout in, in those technologies that's just not going to work unless you've got, you know? When when you say uh, specialist, a specialist you exactly, are you referring to a like a specialized vendor in a particular area, or are you yeah, referring to a specialist on staff? Yeah, I'm I'm kind of thinking maybe in both terms in terms of mm -hmm. you know it can the industries be fully converged through acquisitions or through training and those kind of things, or is there always going to be niches that are carved out by these these best of breeds that the Maybe it's not worth the energy for someone who specializes in networks to go that far into security or vice versa. I think we mentioned it, um, the statement a bit earlier, which was around lawful inspection or legal inspection of traffic and those sort of security environments and those sort of regional requirements in the globe. There's always going to be specialist areas that, um, that, that commercial network and security companies will question whether they're going to invest the amount of R&D required for those niche areas. I mean, certainly we've got a few customers that are doing lawful inspection globally, um, but it's a very, very specific requirement. So I, I would say, yes, there are corner cases, but in general, you know, the, the convergence of the, of the management of security and networking is happening. Whether that's in one product is a different question. Managing it through a single set of policies is different to the underlying technology that you're using to secure or transport the data. Well, in talking about convergence between networking and security, uh, uh, the largest probably acquisition that Juber has ever made was a net screen back in 2004, and this brought networking and security together. Uh, we, it took a few, I would say, years to full, do the full convergence, but we ended up on having uh, a, a one unified 
operating system that works across both platforms, SRXs and, and MXs, et cetera. So, so basically an engineer who learns Junos from Juniper, they'll be able to manage both firewall switches, uh, routers. And, and I think uh, ultimately this allows us to bring some security features in different parts of the network, whether you can, you have the capabilities to run it in the router, why not? Because it's the same OS. So uh, having said that, uh, yeah, we see also the 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 multi vendor aspect of uh, of uh, um, um, the security space. Many enterprises they will be still looking at two vendors, for example, for to handle the same traffic and make sure that what this vendor cannot catch and as maybe a second vendor will do. And and I think that's that that alone brings this uh, opportunity for enterprises or service providers to explore. On, uh, on new security areas, startups, et cetera, that might be having specialization in other in other areas that the, the big vendors don't. And um, yeah, th those those things just probably, we have experienced that for a very long time. Um, and now probably it's in a, a more accelerated rate. So we see that security is consumed as a service. It's, it's security, it's a license that a uh, customer is ready to activate when they understand the risk and they can either activate a license in our solution or they can go and buy a second appliance or buy a service from the cloud but ultimately that's a decision they need to that, that they need to make on ongoing basis as long as we can provide uh innovation in that space mm -hmm. and, and maybe just to add i guess looking at this from a service provider's perspective like there's there's many benefits of of the convergence and just not to say the obvious, but but having a single view and being able to manage multiple domains, it really drives operational cost efficiency. And that's really important these days. We're seeing like profit margins continue to be under pressure from increasing competition, not only from other SPs, but also more and more those resellers, the system integrators that are now offering managed security and networking services of their own, putting extra pressure on SP margins. So really like we're looking to optimize how we operate, make it more cost efficient super important for, for the industry right now. Hmm. I think that's a vital part of the component for the service providers, how to keep um, costs down and make things more efficient. Um, I guess moving on then, so we're just talking about broader trends in terms of networking. We've talked covered security, convergence. Um, we've kind of touched a bit at the start um, about sort of AI, machine learning, um, I guess, it's always good if anyone has specific examples of things of, that they're doing with with that sort of AI space that you know maybe are new use cases or things that maybe com companies wouldn't have heard of that we might see becoming more common in the future. Yeah, well, let, let, let me start very quickly. A couple of examples. Um, so we, we as, as I said at the beginning, we we started with AI uh, in the MIST portfolio, mostly in the in the wireless land. And then we brought it progressively into the LAN and, and now into the SD1. So um, uh, on Wi-Fi specifically, what we're we doing with AI, and especially when you think of a Wi-Fi when you manage it for small, smaller branches. So the, the possibility to uh, constant, constantly monitor the quality of the experience in, in Wi-Fi. We, our, our CTO in MIST tries to say that app is not uh, a good service. So having the access point app and running doesn't mean that it, it works correctly because maybe someone is we've all tried to connect into um, a wi-fi network that we see full signal and then we never get an ip address for example from the HTTP and things like that so ai is a very good um, tool that can be used here to constantly monitoring every individual that's trying to connect and and try to solve it might, might be that your last uh, apple watch or something software doesn't work correctly and you need to fix something into the controller into something that into the hcp server but if you can anticipate those things before they happen the experience is better and ultimately with ai you can go and ask tell me who are the unhappy users today and you can get a list of those and we're doing that with with mist and marvis and and then this is the task of, of the it operations is i i want to I, the ai is trying to fix things on their own but there will be things that won't happen and it's like okay this area there are five unhappy customers or users most probably is because there's no the access point in that area is not well located or maybe they put a new plant or something that doesn't uh, doesn't get the signal correctly so you see that that you can find trends and 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 things like that the the last addition we did was um uh what we call one assurance so we brought this ai to the one 
being able to detect or anticipate things that happen in the in the one. For example, um, uh, someone is concerning concerned that the Zoom calls don't work well, maybe for a certain period of time, and you can ask specifically what happens to Zoom in this user or this group of users. And and the SD one might be up and running with all the links connected and everything working, but then you it it can tell you well actually. Uh, maybe there's a problem, this goes into a very busy VLAN or it goes into the wrong, uh, maybe you can swap into a different ISP connection. So you see that AI can help you with that because it can it can make those those tests. So so I think AI is here to help uh, in operating better, but in providing better experiences into the users. And, and it's real, we can do it today. Okay, I mean, that's a yeah. bit... No, Likewise, sorry. and just to build to, to David's comments there, we, we, we've all got different names for what we call that functionality. But yeah, it's around those use cases that we're seeing customers commonly faced with. Um, I can't connect it to the, the Wi-Fi. Um, I'm having issues with roaming between access points, so the sticky client problem, in other words. Uh, when trying to access a SaaS application on the internet, it's not performing. But where is, it, where is the issue? Is it in the LAN? Is it in the WAN? Is it in the cloud with, where the application is hosted? Being able to predict where the issue is, identify that problem, and where the future is going is really to be able to automatically rectify the problem by mm -hmm. looking at historic data and applying lessons learned to fix issues proactively to, again, drop down those operating costs. I think we're seeing a lot of investment in that space right now. And I mean, is that something you think is very far into the future or is that something you think, you know, when, when lots of talk about self-healing networks, when are they gonna start coming around? Look, I think that a lot of them are already doing it today. If you look at the Wi-Fi space, for example, what David mentioned earlier what, what Meraki is doing today. These features are available in their in their GA today. Um, as we look more and more into the WAN, I think that that's where we're seeing investment. As we start to see the shift towards SASE, as to, to away from the traditional MPLS networks, to SD WANs, and then of course to, to cloud base, that, that's where really the next set of custom problems will start to appear. As we start to see more and more customers shift in that direction. In the industry, the vendors will then have to respond to that as well. Yeah, I think um, the the more complexity you bring into the picture, probably the longer it takes. And and, and uh, we tend to use the example of the self driving car. Self driving car has it's complex, but it has very simple decisions to make with a lot of data. Simple decisions: steering wheel, accelerate, brake. There isn't much more that it can do, right? Uh, it, those are the reactions to lots, thousands of very complex inputs that it's receiving and analyzing, right? So, but the, the action is simple. In the Wi-Fi, you have options that you, you can do. In the in the LAN, you have options. In the one, you have many options, and and many are not depending on this router that you're trying to act. Could be in the cloud. Could be things that you you cannot you you can detect or guess what happens. That may, you cannot react on that. So I would say. You can do self-driving or, or the, the closed loop in the areas you have full control. And this requires a lot of analytic data and a lot of uh, constantly monitoring and also aggregating data, as, as Dimitri said, from, from previous experiences. But the other areas you can just suggest something. And for those operators that start going end-to-end, -end, they operate an edge cloud themselves, I think they can start correlating and coordinating some of those aspects because they own also the, the other side of, of the problem. But it's not always the case. I think that one of the things that we've seen with the evolution of SD WAN technology, um, Cato, is um, effectively you could think about it in some ways as created an SD WAN in the cloud, right? And then our, our, our backbone today stretches over um, uh, four or five different carriers, and we're, we're monitoring those carriers in real time and selecting the optimum path within the core uh, for the traffic end to end. Um, uh, we've been implementing self-healing now uh, at least two years, and uh, uh, you can uh, um, just the other day I was speaking with our VP of engineering about how the fact that um, uh, if we have an outage, uh, if we lose a link, we can you can think of all, all those different scenarios that you want, but your voice call will, will continue operating, not just in the last mile, not just speaking about HA in the last mile, which a lot of SD-WAN vendors provide. I'm talking about ac actually uh, in, in the core itself. Um, we'll uh, maintain the voice session. So I think that you know self-healing is certainly certainly available. As I mentioned when I first jumped onto the call, as far as artificial intelligence and machine learning is concerned, I, I think it's really, and I think to some extent you guys are saying something very similar. It's really, really important that um, when we start dealing 
uh, at scale with the kinds of um, the kinds of inputs that we now have available to us, whether it's in the whether it's in the Wi-Fi network or whether it's in in the core of the WAN, you have an opportunity to uh, tap a tr just a tremendous amount a, a tremendous uh, amount of data to be able to process that data and to make intelligent decisions around it you need to be running uh, machine learning algorithms ai uh, of some some sort i know you know with our guys we use it on the uh, cato uh, mdr service uh, we capture the metadata of all the traffic going across our, our backbone and we store all that data in a in a data warehouse, both security and network information. And then we've got machine learning algorithm, algorithm, algorithms that are running running against it. And one of the things that they're looking for is periodic communications, which is a major indicator, not the only indicator, but a major indicator of a malware infection. Um, so um, that that's just one example of how it's being used. And I'm sure everyone else has other other examples as well. Well, this is exactly what we recommend to our service providers. So obviously, at Juniper, we help them to build enterprise services, but we also help them to build their IP core networks, right. etc. So, so in that in, in that area, uh, solutions that are self healing, uh, we call it Juniper Health Bot, that is exactly monitoring all the time, and it can anticipate problems. If you see that the CPU of a cart in a in a core router is going up. Or something, you know, you can anticipate there's something bad going, going to happen in, in the next few minutes. So, so it can self-correct. It can shift traffic somewhere else. Um, so this is, I think, is that what you just described. That because you you said that you are a vendor and you are an operator at the same time. So you are a service provider combined. So that, this is exactly the advice we're giving to service providers that are trying to operate that that environment. We can help but in both types. And but it, even though we're a service provider, you'll be you'll be excused if we don't buy your product. Right, if we just compete with you guys, it's okay. that's uh, that's okay, <laughs> absolutely. But we need to teach service providers how they compete with you. <laughs> uh, so we're just coming up on time. I mean, we've had a great discussion today. You know about what the future of the network is going to look like: more automation, you know, more IoT, obviously mixed in there. Just lots more data to manage and, and deal with, and get learnings from to build sort of a complex network. Um, I guess just to wrap up, I mean, I mentioned we would do this before the call. If, if there's you know, if everyone has sort of like an idea of what they think the future of cloud networking is going to look like in terms of capabilities or a technology that maybe people aren't familiar with or something that it does for customers that they maybe wouldn't have thought of before. You don't have to have an answer, but I'll leave it if someone wants to. I'm going to be very boring because I'm going to talk about what Cato does today is the future of the cloud. Oh. Um, you know, I can't help it, folks, but, you know, SASE is seen as the future of the cloud. And, Cato really does have a SASE service today. I, I think it's very, very important. But one of the things that we've seen with COVID-19 is we can no longer make this distinction between mobile user and home user and office user. Um, we need to be able to, to deliver security, uh, networking, um, optimization, WAN optimization. Um, you know, all of our services, regardless of location, anywhere and everywhere. And um, I think that's going to be extremely important moving forward, that service providers need to have some kind of uh, converged solution that however way they do that, whoever the products they use, it has to be, they have to be able to deliver this universal service that connects everything to, to everyone else securely. Um, we would like to, for, for everyone, everybody to do that with Cato. We understand that some people might actually choose to do that with Juniper or Silverbeak or somebody else. Um, and we respect that. But I think one way or another, they need to be able to to address the full enterprise through a uh, through one uh, converged solution. Hmm. Yeah, it's a very good vision. I would just insist a little bit on the on the journey. Probably this will be the, the takeaway for for me. Uh, enterprises, they are there might be new vendors, new companies all the time, but an enterprise has been here for many years, and they they are normally evolving from a service they have to another one depends on how ready they are to make the big jump or they want to do it in stages. I think we should be there, uh, be able to support them in all the different stages and gradually providing the technology that is required. So I would insist on that. And yeah, the final goal, this future that, that sometimes hard to imagine, self-driving, fully automated, all security, all on demand, you get what you want, where you want, using whatever technology, whatever access technology required allows this flexibility. Ultimately, this is the business outcome. They want to run their business anywhere fast, cheap, and they, they want it safe and secure, right? So I think that that's 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 the nirvana we need to 
to help them with and, and cost will come out of the automation. Absolutely. Mm, I, I'd agree. I think from my view, it's, it's definitely something that in the future it's, and even now really, it's available wherever the customer is at any time, office, remote, wherever. It's seamlessly interconnectable with different clouds. It's programmable, it's extensible, enabling customers to go beyond IT and solve for those business outcomes. Mm -hmm. And Simon, I know you dropped off for a while, but just any key takeaways from your perspective? Yeah, apologies for that. Uh, Chrome decided to crash on me very nicely. Um, <laughs> I, just to echo my colleague's point, it, it's all about agility, it's about flexibility, it's about making this simple but intelligent. And you know, we work really hard to make this stuff simple. And as everyone said, it's about the ability to use multiple types of cloud, multiple types of security. The ultimate game is to make sure the end user gets the quality of experience they want out of the applications their businesses need to run their business. Because without that, the network's irrelevant. So it's all about quality of experience for the end user. Okay, I agree. So very much a vision of an application-led future. Absolutely. Um, with the, well, where the customer is king, as, as has been in many industries in the world. Um, and capabilities just have to grow to match that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining for joining us. Um, of course, to our speakers and to the audience. I know that Gail is going to drop drop on for a second and just sort of wrap up the event. Uh, so thank you very much. I think this panel has been really informative, uh, and I'm sure the audience has really enjoyed it as well. Thanks, Imbar, for giving us the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you.